get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to a special post-election meeting of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group hosted by the R Street Institute. Our topic today is obviously timely. It's titled, What Now? Uh, we know that come January, Washington is going to look a little different. Uh, media outlets have called the presidential race for former Vice President Joe Biden, and current ballot counts suggest that President-elect Biden's lead in the most debated states is insurmountable. Um, with two runoff elections in Georgia, it's still, however, an open question of which party will control the Senate. Um, either way, the margin is going to be incredibly narrow which is going to present for us and many other organizations a number of questions. What challenges will Biden nominees have to be confirmed in the Senate? What kinds of legislation are possible with a democratically controlled House majority and nearly a 50-50 Senate? Importantly, for those inside and outside of government, how will these changes impact policy goals and priorities? What will change and what will stay the same? To help us, we have a great collection of R Street scholars across a number of policy areas that are gonna to talk to us today about how last week's election will impact their policy work in 2021 and what issues they see are ripe for reform next year. So with us first is Jesse Kelly. Jesse is a manager for R Street's Government Affairs and Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties teams. She is responsible for overseeing and writing on R Street's criminal justice efforts across the United States, both at the federal and state level. Previously, she was counsel at the Marijuana Policy Project, worked as a criminal defense attorney in Alabama, and with the Mississippi Innocence Project on post-conviction issues. She has a bachelor's degree from Troy University and a law degree from University of Mississippi, with a concentration in international law from Cambridge University. Um, next is Clark Packard. Clark is the Trade Policy Council for R Street's Finance, Insurance, and Trade Program, where he does outreach and writes on international trade and investment policy. Clark joined R Street from the National Taxpayers Union, where he spearheaded the organization's work on trade and financial services policy. Previously, he was a policy advisor to former South Carolina governors Nikki Haley and Mark Sanford, and worked in private practice advising financial services companies. Clark has a bachelor's degree from the University of Dayton and a law degree from the University of South Carolina. Next is Philip Rossetti. Philip is a senior fellow for R Street's energy team. He conducts research on energy, climate, and environmental policy to identify low cost and free market opportunities to improve environmental outcomes. Previously, Philip was with the minority staff on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Before that, he was the director of energy policy at the American Action Forum conducting economic analysis on federal energy and environmental policy. Philip received a master's in international relations and diplomacy from the Whitehead School of Diplomacy at Seton Hall, and also received a Bachelor of Arts in political science from the University of New Mexico. And finally, we have Jeff Wessling. Jeff is a fellow for the technology and innovation team at R Street, where he focuses his research on telecommunications and online content policy. Previously, he was a legal fellow in the office of Commissioner Brendan Carr at the FCC, working on a variety of issues such as broadband classification and wireless infrastructure. Before this, he worked as a research assistant with Silicon Flatiron Center, um, authoring a variety of reports and papers, primarily on wireless issues. He has a bachelor's degree from University of Arizona and a law degree from the University of Colorado. Now, before I turn it over to the panel, we start with some of the questions. I do want to remind people there is um, an option at the bottom of your screen on Zoom where you can submit questions. There should be a Q&A part at the bottom. Feel free to do so at any time, and we're going to try to get to those as much as we can throughout the hour. So to begin, I think we're going to start with the most obvious, and we'll probably do this just going around for the entire panel, and whoever wants to start can go first. But in your respective policy areas, and you know, when I gave your biographies, we tackle a number of different policies at R Street. How do you expect a Biden administration to differ most from the Trump administration in your policy fields? So whoever wants to kind of give a brief summary of that, feel free to begin. Sure, since I was introduced first, I will try to answer the question first. Um, during his presidential campaign, Joe Biden promised to end cash bail, mandatory minimum sentencing, and the federal death penalty. And candidate Biden also said the US could reduce its prison population by more than half. Well, with that said, President Trump did sign the First Step Act into law during his administration. And that 
law now takes steps to alter the federal criminal justice system and ease some of those punitive prison sentences at the federal level, which impacts about 181,000 imprisoned people. But unfortunately, the First Step Act doesn't apply to state prisons or local jail where about 2.1 million Americans are being held. So hopefully the name of the law says it all. You know, it's just a first step. There's plenty of more work that can be done moving forward. And what's important to note when it comes to criminal justice reform is that both parties are interested in taking steps to reform. It just depends on a set of variables, to, you know, including public outcry, political feasibility and such. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with a Biden administration. I'm excited to work with a Republican led Senate if it comes to that, because I think criminal justice is an issue that really transcends party. Great. Um, Clark, do you want to lead us next? Yeah, I can I can talk a little bit here. Um, the, it looks like it, look they're they're focused the, the Biden administration's focus. Uh, they've been crystal clear about this. Their first year is going to be almost exclusively focused on dealing with the, the pandemic and the economic recovery. Um, you know that was a major political issue. They they've been crystal clear that that's their top priority. Um, Obviously, Donald Trump uh, was pretty terrible on, on international trade and tariffs uh, the last four years. But the, the question is, how do, how do we get there? Um, and, and it's actually you know, relevant to R Street's work on sort of reinvigorating the first branch of government. But if you look back in, in, in 1930, right, uh, President Hoover and Congress passed and he signed uh, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs uh, that were very dramatic, very high tariffs, basically across the board on every import. Um, and everybody's seen the famous scene from, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off with Ben Stein as the high school economics teacher, and he's talking about the, the negative ramifications of, of the Smoot-Hawley tariffs. But um, so th those tariffs, they didn't necessarily cause the Great Depression, right? But they certainly deepened and prolonged it. Um, and shortly thereafter, Congress recognized its own parochial limitations and began delegating authority over tariffs to the executive branch. And the assumption was, was pretty straightforward that, that the executive branch would be less parochial, less uh, prone to capture, less sort of protectionist than the, exec uh, than, than the Congress was. Uh, and for about 80 years, that was a correct assumption, uh, enter Donald Trump, uh, and you get a person in the White House who's way more protectionist than the average member of Congress. Um, and, and, you know, I think that the, the tariffs, the results have, have been exactly as a lot of us predicted, that they wouldn't change other countries' behavior. It would just impose massive costs on the United States. Um, and, and so that's sort of the, the end of the breach walks Joe Biden. Joe Biden uh, has been skeptical of uh, the, the president's tariffs and, and during the campaign complained about the tariffs. Um, you know, my, I don't think he'll be as pro trade liberalization as, as our street would like, or as I would like. Um, but I, I do think that he's going to be certainly better than where Donald Trump was on this. And, and he'll be consistent with where, um, you know, previous presidents have been, every president, Republican or Democrat since FDR has basically been pro-trade except for Donald Trump. So I think that Joe Biden will kind of uh, move back, move the center of gravity back toward that, that pre-existing consensus. Great, thank you, Clark. Um, Philip, we'll go with you next. Sure, uh, so in a word different, uh, but I think this is actually gonna be a little bit more interesting than many are anticipating. Uh, Biden, you know, having been VP for Obama, I think a lot of people expect a return to the Obama style of energy policy, but that might not be as likely as many think. So as a bit of a backgrounder, uh, 2009, Wax and Markey, big climate legislation failed, uh, did not get taken up in a Democratic controlled Senate. And since then, a lot of uh, Obama's energy environment actions were done at the executive level through regulation under the Clean Air Act. So Clean Power Plan is a good example of that. And the uh, Waters of the United States and other you know, big uh, regulation. Uh, those regulations had a really big uphill battle in the courts. And in some situations, they didn't actually get tested. So the Supreme Court issued a stay on the Clean Power Plan uh, 
uh, Justice uh, Scalia passed away. And then essentially that wasn't resolved until Trump did away with the regulation. Uh, so just saying that Biden will return to those regulations uh, is not necessarily guaranteed because that court case had not been settled. And obviously the Supreme Court very heavily leans uh, conservative now. Uh, additionally, some of those regulations, the targets were already achieved. So I think a lot of people have the impression that Trump rolled back these regulations and then we didn't achieve the environmental progress. Uh, but what we actually saw in the data is that the baseline for way off. Uh, and Obama was much more pessimistic about our environmental progress than was warranted. Uh, so just saying, okay, we're gonna re-implement these regulations, uh, to what effect if we've already achieved the outcome? So Biden is gonna have to craft new regulations to fit the environmental agenda that he's seeking. Uh, and I say that because a big legislative effort uh, one, if Republicans take uh, Georgia in January, that's going to be totally off the table. But even if they don't, a big environmental package through the Senate is going to be very difficult because they will have to get votes from Joe Manchin and these uh, you know, senators that are in Republican-leaning states. Um, so executive action will likely be the preferred method, but Biden will face more constraints uh, than Obama did in that regard. Uh, the one thing that I also think is worth mentioning is Biden has promised to re-enter the Paris Agreement. Uh, the Paris Agreement is, for those unaware, a non-binding agreement, which means it did not require Senate approval the way other uh, international agreements do. Uh, this normally wouldn't mean anything except that there was a legal argument that never got tested as to if one can regulate under the Paris Agreement, under uh, provision of the Clean Air Act, known as Section 115, where if you're in an international agreement, you can regulate. Uh, this never got settled. It was the primary reason why the Trump administration pulled out of the Paris Agreement, because they did not want a subsequent administration to have that sort of regulatory authority. Uh, and that could be another sort of pitched legal battle. Uh, so generally what I expect is that Biden will go in gun, guns blazing, uh, unable to enact a, the ambitious climate agenda that he promised on the campaign with clean energy standard and new climate offices, uh, but he will try to regulate to the maximum authority that he can, uh, and we're going to see these legal wounds sort of reopened as they are once again contested. Uh, so that's my quick take, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss more on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Phil. And then uh, we'll conclude here with, um, initially with Jeff. Yeah, no, I think somewhat similar is that we'll see a lot of similarities between Trump and Biden in terms of going after some of the, the big tech platforms. But I think it's for very different reasons and for very different approaches. And the big one, obviously, is Section 230. Uh, for those that haven't been following the news, uh, Section 230 is the law that basically says you can't treat the uh, online platforms as the speaker of what their users post to the website. So I can't sue, you know, R Street, or I can't sue Facebook for what R Street says about me, right? I can only sue R Street for what they say about me if they defame me, whatever. And we've seen a lot of talk from Republicans and from the Trump administration about revoking 230 uh, in regards to anti-conservative bias. They think that a lot of these platforms have been uh, selectively targeting conservative voices online and, and trying to silence those, those voices. And they are trying to argue then that you know platforms shouldn't be getting the Section 230 protection uh, if they don't uh, moderate in an unbiased way. Um, but at the same time, we have seen Joe Biden call for a revocation of Section 230 as well, and a lot of different talks about how we can change the law. But the Democrats' perspective is more focused on online harms and disinformation. So they want to see Section 230 changed to basically take more content down. So we'll see a lot more of the same talk about Section 230 being a problem, but now it's going to be a problem from the sense that it allows companies to leave up uh, too much bad content versus... Uh, it prevents companies from, you know, taking down bad content. Uh, we'll also probably see a lot of uh, antitrust talk over the next, you know, couple of years. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats have both, you know, tried to target some of these these big tech platforms with some of the, the conduct that they've uh, engaged in. Um, I think the Democrats might be more willing to go away from a consumer welfare standard, which I think would be a very bad thing. Um, but we have seen, you know, both sides talk about different competition policy uh, review of some of the big tech platforms. And uh, the last thing I'll touch on is just on the telecommunications side. I, I don't think we'll see too much difference in terms of how they treat telecommunications providers. The one thing uh, that will definitely 
come up is going to be the net neutrality regulations. And that'll probably be more at the FCC. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Democrats uh, almost immediately go and reverse back to a Title II classification of broadband, which, uh, for those that don't follow, comes with it a lot of different utility style regulations uh, that were designed for telephones, but could be applied to broadband companies if, if they are classified as a Title II service. Um, so we'll see that at the FCC. Um, but I, I think a lot of the work that the commission does on like spectrum and, and uh, you know, wireless infrastructure, I think a lot of that uh, is pretty bipartisan. So we probably won't see too much, you know, big, big fights in the telecom sphere outside of some, you know, a few politically charged issues. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And, and I kind of noticed in, in this opening round when everyone was talking, there are a lot of instances where some things will remain the same and some things will remain different. And a lot of that probably is going to determine, this was hinted a couple of times, the ultimate control of the Senate. We have the two runoff races in Georgia, which could potentially give either the Republicans or Democrats control of the Senate. And looking at maybe the, the different policies and topics in these different policy areas that are street and and you all specifically are thinking on, what sort of um, advice are you offering, if you could offer the Biden transition team? Either way, whatever control of the Senate ends up happening, it's gonna be important if any positive legislation or any significant movement in Congress, it's probably gonna to have to be bipartisan just because of the slim nature, especially in the Senate. So if you were advising the Biden transition team, what sort of advice are you giving them? What sort of overlap do you think a Biden administration have could have with, let's say, hypothetically, a Republican-controlled Senate? What sort of movement would you focus on or would you advise the Biden team to focus on? Yeah, that's a really great question, Anthony. Um, so I'll go back to the First Step Act. There has been some discussions of how to appropriately fund the provisions that were included in that. So I think that would be a great door to open in initial conversations is just saying, you know, you pass this by a huge margin. It's a bill that you know, the Biden administration really cares about as well. So let's get that properly funded first. And then I would flag one other issue in the criminal justice space, and that's relating to mandatory minimums. So uh, President-elect Biden has said that he wants to eliminate mandatory minimum sentences. And to make this happen on a federal level, you know, he'd have to appoint a range of officials who share that view. Um, but also it would impact a ton of, of people who are you know, serving time in prison. So there are more than 60,000 people currently serving mandatory minimum sentences in federal prison, according to the US Sentencing Commission. But repealing mandatory minimums or passing a safety valve law that doesn't repeal them, but would give judges discretion to sidestep a mandatory minimum, that would require an act of Congress. And I think it's something that a Republican-led Senate could be particularly interested in, especially the safety valve piece. Um, yeah, I, I can jump in here. Um, in in 2015, Congress passed what was known as Trade Promotion Authority um, and, and TPA for short, uh, basically was a bipartisan effort um, to give o President Obama the authority he needed to negotiate uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Um, and, and what Trade Promotion Authority does is it essentially says that, sets a template for what Congress believes needs to be in a trade agreement. And if the trade agreement that is negotiated by the administration, the executive branch, meets the, the guidelines established by Trade Promotion Authority, then the bill gets um, what's known as fast-tracked. Um, it can't be filibustered uh, in the Senate. It, it, it demands an up or down vote in the Senate. It, it establishes a time frame under which each, the, each relevant committee, so the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Senate Finance Committee must consider the trade agreement. Uh, and that, that was a six-year authority. Um, so that will expire in 20, or uh, I guess July of 2021. Um, and so my advice to the Biden administration would be, that was a, a really contentious vote in, in 2015. Basically the, the breakdown was, you know, maybe 15 Senate Democrats voted for it and 45 Senate Republicans voted for it. In the House, it was, you know, 190 Republicans with about 30 uh, House Democrats, always sort of the moderate uh, Democrats. Um, 
you know, Ron Kind of Wisconsin led the effort there. Um, in the Senate, there are a bunch of pro-trade Democrats like Ron Wyden, um, Tim Kaine, Mark Warner. Those guys ha have been established themselves as, as pretty strong free traders. Um, so knowing that it was a really contentious fight in 2015, um, I would advise the Biden administration to get on, sort of begin thinking about this early in the administration and whether or not they want to seek trade promotion authority. I would strongly encourage them to do it. Um, it, it facilitates uh, the passage of trade agreements. It, it, and that makes a certain amount of sense, right? That you don't want, uh, by forcing an up or down vote with no amendments to an agreement, that way you don't, you're not in a position where uh, 535 members of Congress are trying to negotiate a trade agreement, right? You allow the executive branch, it's uh, sort of plenary authority in foreign affairs to negotiate and then bring back an agreement with input from Congress on the front end. But as long as it meets these criteria, then you move forward with it. So I, I think that, that that's one area that's ripe for bipartisan work. The other area is, is there's a bipartisan sort of emerging consensus that China really is a bad actor on trade. Um, and, and how do you sort of think through uh, that it, the, the assumptions about Chinese mercantilism and, and abusive trade practices um, for about 15 years, but you know when China joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization in, in 2000, um, you know lots of people across the aisle believed that well, if you admit China into the WTO and they buy into this rules-based global trading system. That'll somehow lead to democracy or you know market capitalism in China, and, and it sadly it, it turns out that that was incorrect. Some of the assumptions, the underlying assumptions that were made at that time. So now there's an emerging consensus, and and so the question is, what do you do about that? And and I think that there is broad bipartisan consensus about their misdeeds, um, and I think that that. There's also an awareness that, that the Trump administration's approach of unilateral tariffs has not changed uh, Beijing's behavior and in fact has imposed enormous costs on the United States. So there are ways of, of, of trying to address those issues. Um, I've written about that. I have a paper coming out this year on that. Um, but I do think that there is a, a broad sort of rethinking of US-China economics. And I think that that Will, will drive a lot of what happens in the Biden administration. And, and he will have support uh, for a new approach, but also a, a more hawkish approach toward China than maybe existed 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. So uh, in the energy space, I guess I'll jump in and just point out that my advice to a Biden administration would be to resist the temptation to uh, ex execute by pen and phone. Uh, I don't think that that model is going to be terribly durable or viable, and uh, the court battles are going to be uh, a long uphill slog. Uh, and whether or not you know Republicans win in Georgia, uh, if Republicans lose, there is the possibility of maybe getting ARPA C and some of these big climate initiatives through just barely. But we did see that uh, what was most interesting about the 2020 election is there was not this big leftward shift that I think many people sort of took for granted and expected. Uh, and one of the things that people are saying was a part of the reason we didn't see that was the Green New Deal and the lack of popularity for these you know, big government-centric uh, climate packages that have very high costs as for a global problem where you might not necessarily get the benefit. Uh, so I'd say look at you know, potential victories on the margins uh, because Republicans have been doing better in the climate space at least you know, my time on the Hill, uh, because they've been able to sort of fill in that vacuum and say, hey, we don't want the Green New Deal, but we are in favor of you know, more like carbon offsets or tree planting or these sort of low cost abatement opportunities. Uh, so there is a way for a you know, bipartisan uh, agreements that are kind of on the margins, probably tied with bigger packages that can actually score more environmental wins and be more durable uh, and are not just going to be back uh, to this kind of back and forth uh, because the illegal outlook is just not as good for a Biden administration. Uh, so that'd be kind of my advice. And it's, I know that the temptation is going to be very strong for a Biden administration and Democrats to kind of go back to the way they did it. But bipartisanship is really the path forward uh, for durability in the energy environment space.
Yeah, and and on the tech side, um, I, I think that there actually is a lot of bipartisan support for some of the underlying ideas, and maybe the actual details are st still need to be, you know, glossed over and and uh, refined. But um, I was talking about net neutrality at the FCC. I, it's still under a law that is completely outdated, right? It's the Telecom Act was written in 96. It's amending the Communications Act in 1934. Like we, we have these outdated, um, you know, regulatory regimes for a, a service that people just didn't envision. So I think there is strong support to have some kind of reforms to that. And with regards to net neutrality, there's, you know, bipartisan agreement on the general principles. Don't block uh, lawful traffic. Um, have transparency requirements on, on platforms or not platforms, sorry, on, on ISPs. Uh, so I think that they, they that Congress could move forward with some legislation in, in this area and have enough bipartisan support to actually do a lot of good. Because right now, what we're what we're seeing is that every four to eight years, the FCC is just reversing its decision that, that they made four years ago or eight years ago, and and you know keeps pinballing back and forth. And that's not really the best regulatory environment for for companies that are trying to deploy broadband services to to have these different regimes every eight years, and they're very differing regimes. Uh, so I'd like to see bipartisan agreement at, on the Hill to, to actually go in and resolve some of these issues because we're just trying to shoehorn broadband into either, you know, classic telephone regulation or just this, this hands-off approach. Um, another area where we could see some bipartisan agreement is on privacy. Um, you know, there's obviously some disagreements about how we actually want to, to govern privacy in the United States. Um, but you know, we, we also can see it, the piecemeal approach at the state level could cause some harms and can, can be difficult for companies to comply with. Uh, so there's some incentive still to have a privacy law at the national level, um, but we'll see if they can actually uh, find enough agreement to, to move forward. You know, right now the issues are gonna be, should that pre, uh, preemption exist? Uh, should there be a private right of action? You know, or should it just be FTC only? Or maybe we grant more authority to the FCC and, and allow them to go after monetary damages without having to get a consent decree first. Uh, there's just a lot of different uh, factors and details that need to be worked out on, on privacy. But at the end of the day, I do think that uh, both parties would agree that maybe uh, a national privacy law at this point would be a good thing. And, and just how we go about achieving that law will be where, you know, we have to make concessions and, and, and work together to find solutions. But uh, I think that's an area we can move forward on. Right. And I think a lot of the comments that you guys made identify one interesting aspect as well. And it's often a focus of the governance team, which is looking at Congress's Article One powers and how Congress itself can help alleviate some of these burdens and struggles that we're going to see, presumably for a Biden administration as the same we saw for a Trump administration. I think there were some really interesting comments about we mentioning how unilateral tariffs were a problem how the ability for the executive branch to enter and leave certain international agreements from administration to administration, the issues of trying to interpret certain regulations under arguably outdated statutes or trying to change and revise maybe regulatory views of something more pressing under more political pressure, really bypassing a lot of Congress's influence or appropriate oversight. So maybe looking at Congress itself and kind of sidestepping um, the executive branch, what can Congress, you would argue maybe, and some of this might be redundant, but what can Congress itself do to somewhat reassort its authority or its positions on some of these really important policy matters? I'm not sure I'm best suited to go first, but I'm going to give it a try. I'm also going to have to flip your question totally on its head because criminal justice reform is very much a local issue. You know, Tip O'Neill, all politics are local. It's just, it rings more and more true with criminal justice reform year after year. Um, so I'll highlight a little bit of that and then I'll give you two examples of federal bills that I think that, that could work um, for Congress to be active on. So, you know, there are 24 states after this election that have a Republican trifecta. There are 15 states that have a Democratic trifecta. There's only one state in the country that split a House and Senate, and that's Minnesota. And so I think what we saw is that, you know, red states got more red, blue states got more blue, and that's going to trickle down into how they implement and discuss and talk about different 
policies and particularly for criminal justice reform policing reform has been at the forefront of all of these state level conversations recently and so i think you're going to see different paths toward the same goal when it comes to policing reform and how state legislatures tackle that you know colorado almost immediately went into special session passed a bill that was really robust when it came to reforming policing virginia did a very similar thing where they passed a set of bills the governor just this week has signed a few of those into law. But I do think at the state level, you'll see different, maybe collective bargaining issues being discussed when it comes to policing, maybe some decertification, certainly ending no knock warrants, which is something that the federal government could also perhaps weigh in on. And Joe Biden has expressed an interest to end uh, no knock warrants as well as chokeholds and neck restraints. Um, there are two bills that Congress has looked to in the past that are our street has endorsed. Um, one is reinstating Pell Grants. Uh, the REAL Act is the current piece of legislation where that's moving forward, but the 1994 crime bill eliminated the opportunity for incarcerated students to receive financial aid via Pell Grants, and there's been a robust conversation on both the House, in both the House and the Senate about reinstating uh, those grants for incarcerated students, and I think that that would be something that Congress could really take hold of and own moving forward and something that could be a win for everyone. And then the second piece of legislation I would flag is a federal clean slate legislation. It's a record clearing bill that would automate certain expungement provisions. You know, between 70 million and 100 million Americans, about one in three have some type of criminal record. So having the ability and more access to expungement and record clearing could really benefit um, a ton of people because you know in in this digital era nine and ten employers four and five landlords three and five colleges all use background checks um so congress could really take hold of that record clearing uh clean slate bill and help a lot of people in the country um in 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 my space uh there's been as i mentioned right so after the the smoot hawley tariffs of 1930 congress again, began delegating unilateral authority over to the executive branch. And that started with the Reciprocal Trade Act of 1934. Um, and, and again, for 80 years, that, that balance worked. Um, we cut tariffs dramatically. Um, the United States used its sort of outsized influence to create all sort of, sorts of institutions. The, the World Trade Organization or its predecessor, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, um, and, and, you know, we entered into things like NAFTA and CAFTA, um, and all of those were, were great. But um, I think when, when you look at what tools the, the Trump administration used to pursue a pretty aggressively protectionist agenda, um, you, you start by their bogus claims of, of national security, a national security threat from the importation of steel and aluminum. And, and they did that under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962 that basically gave the executive branch the authority to say, after a study, uh, you know, a, a, a executive, sort of an executive branch study saying it, whether or not the importation of some item in such quantities was a national security threat to the United States. And if so, um, what steps can the, the president take to, to remedy that national security threat? And you know they they produced the Department of Commerce produced a totally nonsense report showing that steel and aluminum were national security threats to the United States. You know from allied countries, right? Which was ridiculous. Um, you know Canadian steel is not a national security threat to the United States, but that was the claim the Trump administra administration used. Excuse me. Um, and then to, to prosecute its trade war with China, it relied on Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974, um, which again basically says that over foreign countries, if they treat United States exports unfairly, uh, then the United States can impose tariffs of its own as a tool or a cudgel to get the other country to lower its tariffs. Um, and so, so the, the president was... I guess, legally within his authority to, to do this, um, but it caught a lot of members of Congress off guard and, and they began thinking, and there was a robust debate about how do you claw those authorities back without cre recreating the dynamic that led to Smoot-Hawley. Um, and so I, I would point to two bills that, that were, uh, have been 
uh, released and, and, and have been thought about by various members of Congress. Uh, one was by Senator Pat Toomey of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I, I helped advise them on this bill. Essentially what it did was it said that if you want to make a national security claim, the Congress has to approve potential tariffs before they can go into effect. That's not to say Congress can set the tariff rates, but the executive branch would propose a tariff and then it forced a, a vote in both the House and Senate uh, before the, the tariffs. And if it passed, then the tariffs could go into effect. But if it didn't pass, then the tariffs wouldn't go into effect. Um, and, and so that, that bill is sort of floating around out in the ether. Um, Senator Mike Lee introduced, and, and there was a House companion introduced by Ron Kine. Um, so again, a bipartisan effort. Both, both bills have bipartisan support in both the House, the House and Senate. Uh, but in, in, with respect to Section 301, uh, Senator Mike Lee introduced a, a bill called the Global Trade Accountability Act. Again, I, I helped advise them on that. Uh, that would claw back similar authority that, that under Section 301 or Section 201, the executive branch can't just impose unilateral tariffs, in essence, uh, using usurping the, the power to tax, lay and collect duties under the Constitution uh, unilaterally. It, it would force a vote before tariffs can go into effect. Now, um, you know, it, it's my hope that, that President Biden, President-elect Biden, would sign a bill that restricts those authorities. Um, but, but I do know that, you know, is it just going to be an issue? Well, um, it's our guys in charge now, right? The, the good team has this authority. Are, are they really willing to, to sort of curb some of those authorities? But I think long term, uh, we really do need to think about getting this balance right, striking a, an appropriate balance where we don't just have uh, an executive branch that, that can levy massive tariffs and really upset you know, not only the U.S. economy, but also our foreign policy, because trade policy really is uh, a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy. Um, and so if, if you're going to pursue an aggressive agenda, I think you need to get buy-in from the Congress. So I, I would hope that, that the Biden administration would look very seriously at working with Congress to restrain some of these unilateral authorities. As long as uh, we're going in turn, you know, I think in the energy space, uh, Getting back to the original question of how does Congress sort of retake its authority, uh, Congress has to want to do that first. Uh, what's been really interesting over the past few years is as Obama pursued a very uh, executive centric approach and very regulatory heavy, uh, a lot of the Democrats on the Hill have essentially wanted to expand that regulatory authority and put more power in the energy environment making space uh, with the president. Uh, or you know, less so a little bit with Trump, but still, you know, say great regulatory mandates. Uh, if we want to see Congress actually do more of that, we have to respond to why Democrats were in favor of uh, expanding that executive authority, which is what they viewed as Republican obstructionism and uh, you know, no appetite for climate policy. So if we want to see something that preempts that executive authority, you're going to need to see Republicans and Democrats actually come together on some sort of a climate package. Uh, the reality is that that would be a lot less than what Democrats want to settle for. Uh, it's been really interesting to see, you know, some folks uh, on, on one end of the spectrum in the Democratic Party that have essentially wanted to settle for nothing less than a full on commitment to absolute decarbonization, regardless of the cost. Uh, and then you have a lot of moderates who say that they're okay with you know, these sort of marginal victories a lot of Republican moderates that are also saying that they're okay with those marginal victories. And then still, you know, a few that are opposed to anything. Uh, but I think it'll be actually easier to get some compromise from Republicans than will be to get, uh, you know, Democrats on board with the idea of a climate package that doesn't have buy-in from, you know, AOC, Bernie Sanders, uh, because they've been so influential in that space. So the pathway for that would be very difficult. Uh, and I think it would have to start with the president and Biden would have to be the one to actually say, hey, I want to work with Mitch McConnell on a, a climate package. Whether or not that's actually likely, uh, I would not want to, you know, guess as to how probable that is because the reality is in the electoral space, contrast is what benefits a lot of candidates. So they've been very happy to see this climate debate play out where they can show a lot of contrast with their opponents. Uh, so getting to that bipartisanship is going to be 
difficult, but it is the only way that you actually reduce the role of the executive in this space. Yeah, and I'll agree with that too. Um, in, in some of the tech issues we've seen, at least in the 230 front, uh, the president trying to go around Congress and going right to the FCC, for example, to reinterpret different provisions of Section 230. And it's really an un unambiguous statute. There's not really much to it. Um, so if, you know, if the Republicans or now, I guess, the Democrats want to make changes to the law, they can do that by passing a law, passing an amendment. Um, but kind of back to what I was talking about with the laws being outdated, you know, Section 230 was passed in the 96 Act. Uh, it was part of the Communications Decency Act, which was itself part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And this is all kind of jargon to say that this was all incorporated into the Communications Act, which technically gives the FCC authority over uh, over Section 230, which it really has no business being a part of. And, and that's a worry to me is where we're saying, okay, we want this policy outcome. We're going to try to really bend the law to you know our favor because it's going to help us right now uh, without realizing how that could hurt in you know, completely different areas. Um, so there really needs to be incentive on Congress and, and the parties in power not to just go, uh, go around the lawmaking process to try to expand administrative agencies just because that might be expedient for one particular issue. And um, we, they'll obviously not be able to get everything they want uh, with, with a lot of these issues. There's probably gonna be compromises on the privacy issue, for example, you know, they might have to uh, give up a little bit of FTC rulemaking if, if you wanna avoid uh, having a state-by-state -state state approach, or if you wanna you know, get rid of a private right of action or, or you know, all these different factors. But um, if, if you can get to that bipartisan agreement, it'll be much stronger and harder to kind of you know, change in the future and, and add a lot more uh, support going forward. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And I think, and, and Jeff and Jesse, you've mentioned this um, a couple of times throughout the hour. I mean, we can take a moment and step outside of Washington. We can look at state policy. You know, in addition to federal elections, there were a number of state and local elections across the country that could potentially shape a number of local and state policy initiatives. Um, Jesse, you talked a little earlier about state policy. Were there certain other um, perhaps states you were looking to or initiatives that you could see happening at the more local level outside of D.C.? Yeah, thanks. So actually on election day, there were more than 7,000 local elections for state representatives, state senator. So there was a lot of stuff happening there. But what's interesting is that a not, not a ton of state legislatures flipped from red to blue. I think there were three chamber switches in states that returned to being Republican after 2018 flip when they went Democratic. So there wasn't a lot of big political shifts. As far as what we're seeing, I mentioned policing reform. That's absolutely going to be a key point of conversation. But this idea of front end diversion, getting people away from the criminal justice system to begin with, is also really taking hold at a local level. And you're seeing a lot of community advocacy around different things like ending cash bail, supporting pre-arrest diversion, and limiting generally who is having to interact with police officers. If you're having a mental health episode or a substance abuse issue, it may not be most appropriate for a police officer to respond. Or if, it's, if an officer does, he may need a social worker or a specific case worker to come along with that police officer to address the issues that are going on. So what's interesting with cash bail is that, uh, well, first off, cash bail is money a defendant pays as collateral in exchange for being let out of jail during the time between their arrest and trial or a plea agreement. And you've heard a lot of federal lawmakers be very interested in this portion of the pre-trial phase. And in fact, uh, President-elect Biden has promised to, you know, quote, lead a national effort to end cash bail. Um, but his pathway there is very, very limited. It is very much a state issue. You know, no president in the past has been able to have much influence on this specific area of criminal justice reform. And, you know, the most recent data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimates that 38% of defendants in the nation's largest counties and cities were detained prior to trial and that nine out of 10 times, they were not able to pay their way out. So this is an issue that's really ripe for reform. I think it does go hand in hand with policing reform, which is sparking national conversation, but figuring out the best way to help people and encourage them down a path towards rehabilitation rather than incarceration is definitely gonna come up in the state. All right. Um, thanks, Jeff, Jesse. And, and Jeff, you were kind of mentioning a little bit of state policy as well. I think you mentioned um, 
um, a couple of other states and kind of looking at your policy field, are there certain developing issues happening at the state level, maybe affected by this election, for instance, that you're keeping your eye on? Yeah, I, I think obviously some of the, the privacy issues that we've seen, um, the, the impetus for a national privacy law really stems from the states acting beforehand. So we'll, we'll definitely be seeing a lot of things uh, at the state level on things like privacy and perhaps um, if the federal government doesn't, you know, reverse course on net neutrality, they could, you know, try to get around the, the preemption provisions of, of the FCC's 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Um, but I think a little more interesting to me um, is the role that states and local governments play in the actual deployment of broadband. Uh, we do, the, our street institute does a broadband scorecard every year where we rank every state on their, uh, basically their laws and how well they facilitate the deployment of broadband. And with the next generation of wireless networks requiring, you know, the densification of a lot of these net networks with small cells, uh, a lot of the old regulatory processes for review and for deployment are, you know, outdated and designed for a lot larger uh, towers and cells. Um, so I think moving forward, it's going to be really interesting to see how states are, you know, trying to get this next generation broadband service to their to their uh, citizens without uh, kind of impeding the progress, but also without um, you know, taking away too much authority from the local governments with regards to zoning and, and aesthetic review. Um, but there's a lot of policies, I think, that are, are pretty bipartisan that we should see in a lot more states that we don't necessarily see. And, you know, one of those could be like a dig once policy where if uh, any, you know, corporation or any government agency is, is going to be trenching or digging, uh, maybe to install kind of pipelines or something, they can also uh, install conduit or allow, you know, ISPs to come in and deploy fiber into those trenches without having to reopen the ground and retrench that that area, just making it easier to deploy. So I think the states have a very big role to play in some of these deployment uh, issues that the that the companies are facing right now. And uh, it, it'll be really interesting to see kind of how they take that, that priority moving forward. All right. um, thanks, Jeff. I know for Philip and Clark, maybe uh, local state policy isn't as much of an emphasis in your two fields, but if there's anything you two wanted to add, feel free. Uh, I'll just add that the subnational climate movement is still very strong, and we see a lot of states that are still moving towards RPS, local policies that essentially constrain uh, energy policy in various ways. So that's not going away anytime soon. And whatever policy comes out is gonna to have to be recognizing that there is that at the state level in California and these other states are still uh, reducing their uh, fossil fuel consumption in the electric power sector. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much to add, right? I mean, since trade policy, international trade and investment policy is so, you know, again, a, sort of a component of, of U.S. foreign policy. There's, there's very little uh, that takes place at, at the at the subnational level. So, great. And, and we got um, one comment from uh, one of the viewers asking, kind of, what about these different topics? I he mentions campaign finance reform, electoral reform, a lot of the stuff. You know, for instance, maybe some of the issues, maybe the governance team, for example, where I work would tackle. And I think it's one of the things that illustrates there are so many different policy subjects and so many different um, policy implications of elections and who controls the White House and who controls Congress. And for instance, our street doesn't necessarily tackle many issues related to campaign finance. Electoral could, you know, no matter, it'd be a broad range of things. It could be anything from looking at, do we need to reform the electoral college? Should the cap on Congress be removed? A lot of those large scope things. And I think one of the things our street does very well is try to look at very niche or very interesting topics and try to develop a policy that's one ideologically consistent, but one that can have bipartisan support, kind of that common, the common sense solution that can gain a, gain a smart, good, broad coalition to enact actual change. Um, so maybe it's fitting that we can include with this, you know, kind of the, the heading, the caption for this event was what now, what's going to happen next? And maybe we can just finish with, everyone did a nice, really nice job and really helpful job of summarizing what the Biden administration will potentially or probably do, um, initiatives that Congress and the new Biden administration can work on together, some potential pitfalls. Or in, so maybe just a quick round robin, maybe it's fair that we go in reverse order this time. We'll start with Jeff then Philip Clark and end with Jesse on anything we're missing. Is there anything that policymakers are keeping their eye on this, but maybe a looming threat that's out there, really this issue that um, a lot of policymakers haven't thought about and should in this next Congress. 
Yeah, sure. I've, I've got a pet project that I think is really interesting um, that I've been trying to think about, you know, how should we handle it moving forward? And that's spectrum management in the United States. We have two separate spectrum managers, the FCC and the NTIA. Uh, the FCC handles all um, non-federal users of, of radio spectrum, and then the NTIA just governs the, the federal users. Um, and that's, you know, kind of been how we've we've been handling this since the 20s, I believe, when when the federal agencies first got together and just created this interdepartment radio advisory uh, committee where they just kind of handle all these interference uh, issues themselves. But now we've gotten to a point where theoretically the two agencies might disagree and no one really has the ultimate say into, you know, who's going to win out. And that's why we've also seen a lot of really kind of high profile spectrum disputes uh, bleed over into the public eye. We've seen a lot of federal agencies that um, don't like what the FCC is doing and, and take that to Congress or take that to the White House and, and, try to say, no, we shouldn't lose our, our radio operating rights for this particular band because of these reasons. And, uh, you know, that's just not really an efficient way of, of handling, you know, very technical disputes. Uh, so I think moving forward, and this might be a little bit of a pie in the sky project though, is, is how can we reform our spectrum management regime and what, you know, different steps can we take? Is it just improving collaboration between the NTA and the FCC or potentially is it, you know, vesting all spectrum management authority with one agency or is it maybe uh, creating a whole new agency that could be in charge. And, and I think that that's just a, a really interesting kind of what's next idea, because it's something that we don't really think about, um, but it's starting to cause problems. And, and as we delay deployment of services, you know, other countries can take the lead. It takes longer for, for consumers to get the products that they need. So we really want to streamline these, these regulatory uh, reviews and, and, you know, allocation of operating rights. And I think that this would be a really interesting project for, for Congress to look at moving forward. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about climate again. So sorry for like energy enthusiasts that I've spoken only about climate so far, but that is going to be a big elephant in the room for uh, you know this administration because it is a global collective action problem, and thus far the entire narrative has been focused on domestic policy only. Uh, and you know, anytime forest fires happen, hurricanes, people say, oh, we need to cut emissions, we need to reduce emissions, uh, and that was essentially galvanizing. Uh, in the fact that the president wasn't doing anything on climate, but now that the president will actually have an appetite for these policies, there's going to be a question of, do these actually reduce the cost that we are expected to face? And the answer to that is going to be no, if you're not actually getting reciprocal benefits abroad. Uh, so, you know, just some quick math, China is almost twice our emissions and by 2030 is going to be much more than twice our emissions, uh, you know, potentially even as much as three times, depending on how effective we are at uh, abating our own emissions. Uh, so without having some sort of uh, policy to address that growth abroad, uh, there's no actual domestic benefit to these climate actions. So having a response and an international paradigm that you can br uh, bring these actors to the table is gonna be really important for a Biden administration as they go into 2024, you know, depending on if it's Kamala Harris or someone else in that election, uh, they need to have a response to say that they've actually abated those costs. Uh, otherwise, just going to be more of the same. So that is going to be, I think, key uh, because if they don't address it, then Republicans are just going to say, you know, we spent all this money, we got no benefit from it, and that's going to be a very powerful message if, if that occurs. So I'm very interested to see how Biden will approach internationally because. Paris Agreement alone is, uh, you know, a non-binding agreement does not really garner that much abatement uh, because the NDCs are still pretty low commitment from everyone involved. Uh, so that's what I'm watching. Um, yeah, look, I, I think the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is the great unfinished business of, of our time if, in international trade and investment. Um, if you think that China is a bad actor and they need to improve their commercial practices and improve their commercial standards. And at the same time, you think that tariffs are just taxes paid by Americans on the import of goods, uh, which I do. I think most economists and lawyers, trade lawyers that look at this would agree with that. If you accept those two premises, then the TPP makes perfect sense, right? It, it was designed to create a, a free trade block sort of encircling Beijing and China um, and trying to get companies to move supply chains out of 
of, of China and into this new trading bloc. Um, and it was the first trade agreement that the United States negotiated that to completion that was never ratified. Um, and so I think that that is the, the, the great unfinished business. Um, I, I think that there, you know, it, it's an open question on whether or not the, the Biden administration wants to jump back into the TPP. They, you know, he was obviously a part of the Obama administration that negotiated what I thought was a pretty good deal. Um, but, but the politics were terrible. Um, and so the question is, you know, is, is there a window, potential window to get this thing done? Uh, it's my hope. Uh, I know that there would be some enthusiasm among Senate Republicans to do that. Um, but, but again, I think, you know, I, I think a lot of this discussion is in some ways premature, if only because they are just going to be so laser focused on, on confronting the pandemic and the, the economic recovery. But once you get past that, I think there are going to be choices that need to be made. And, and I hope that they can sort of get back to that, to that consensus that I talked about at the beginning, which is, you know, international trade and investment is good. Uh, it's important for U.S. leadership. It's important for economic growth. Um, so let's, let's jump back into this and not let the rest of the world kind of move along while the U.S. is stagnant. And that's the unfortunate reality of the last four years. We've gotten lapped. Um, as the rest of the world moved on. And that's going to hurt us long term, our, our soft influence and also our competitiveness. Yeah, like, like Jeff, I sort of have my own very specific pet project within criminal justice, and that would be juvenile justice reform. And I'm really hoping that President-elect Biden and his administration can step in and make some critical shifts there. Um, you know, juvenile justice reform has always kind of been an overlooked issue. Um, and I'm hoping that the Biden administration will reinvest in the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Prevention. It's their goal to ensure that juveniles' records are expunged or you know properly sealed uh, to prevent prevent young people from being incarcerated in adult facilities and to end the practice of incarcerating young people for status offenses. A status offense is a crime that wouldn't otherwise be a crime if you were an adult, like underage drinking or truancy from school. And what's encouraging is that on the Biden campaign website, they have pledged uh, at least a billion dollars to advance those efforts of the OJJDP and uh, have articulated a goal of reducing juvenile imprisonment to almost zero, which is actually very, very doable and would not jeopardize public safety in any way. And there's a ton of research on that. I'd be happy to, to share with anyone who has questions, but uh, you know, that, that's what I would be most interested in. I, I recently wrote a policy paper about a child's right to camp counsel and juvenile public defenders. And I think that would tie in nicely with some additional funding on the federal level to how we're treating young people who are justice involved. Great. Well, thank you again. That wraps up um, our event for today. Um, again, if please check out our website, rstreet.org, if you want to check out any of our scholars' works, um, things they've written, uh, things they've talked about, all these different issues, everything from criminal justice, trade, tech, energy, it can be, it's it's found right there on the website. For the governance team as well, a lot of stuff that focuses more specifically on Congress, check out ledgebranch.org and uh, be on the lookout for another email invite for a legislative branch capacity working group event. And until then, thank you everyone and stay safe and we will talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you.